Welcome to New Branch Community Church. We're so glad you're here today. And we are in a series called From Stress to Rest. How many people have some stress in your life? <laughs> and so we've been talking about saying in, in order to move from stress to rest in the first message two weeks ago. Last week we had uh, missionary Daryl Palmer with us. If you missed that, newbranch.tv is our YouTube site. You can pick up his message that he had and, and updated us on some of the missions work that he's doing uh, over in all, all over the world. And, um, and then a week before that, we started this series, Stress to Rest, and we talked a little bit about saying, hey, you have to set limits on your life. And uh, most of us know that, to say, hey, in order to go from stress to rest, we, we have limits, and we, we have to set those. But the question I have is this, is how many people have said, yeah, I know that. And, and you looked at that message, and you went through it, and maybe you're trying to practice it, and then you said, but you know what the real problem is, is there's a huge obstacle in my way, and it's, it's a it's people, right? Anybody have people that are stressing you out? <laughs> Anybody say, hey, man, if I could get the people out, I could do all those principles and I would be fine. I know what to do. And now mine has a face to it. Or you say, hey, you know what? I even implemented it. You, you've actually preached on this before. or Maybe you've heard stuff like this before. You go, hey, I've tried it. Where I went, hey, I tried setting limits, but then somebody came alongside me and they made me feel bad about setting limits. <laughs> and, um, and so then it's just easier to do it. Anybody have that? And so today we want to talk a little bit about this, because I, I really believe you can't move from stress to rest if we don't get this one principle. How do we set limits without feeling guilt, right? Because some of us are going, hey man, I set limits, and then it's like it's even worse after I set them, because then these people come into my life, and they make me feel bad about it, and, and I go, man, I don't even want to bother with it, so I just go ahead, and I'll be stressed out, and I don't know what to do with it. And so today we want to take a look at how do we do that. And I believe God has a plan. I believe this principle is found in his word. And so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write this down, because this might take you some time to really absorb what this means. It's going to be simple to say, and it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to do. Ask me how I know. Huh. Um, and, and the principle is this. If you want to learn how to set limits without guilt, if you want to move from stress to rest, you've got to understand this one principle. I am responsible to others, not for them. And we want to really kind of unpack both thoughts here, okay? There's two thoughts, not just one. I am responsible to other people, not for them. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the person next to you or the person that's stressing you out right now. Don't, don't look at them, please. <laughs> and I want you to say to them, I am responsible. Can you say this together? No, seriously, look at them and say, I am responsible to you, not for you. <laughs> that feel good to everybody? First honest conversation you've had for a while. Huh? And, uh, and say, well, why are you talking to me? <laughs> I got you. We stirred up some conflict. That's not a bad thing either. We'll talk about that while we talk about this message. Today we want to talk about, hey, how does that work? Why is this biblical? In other words, I, I didn't want to just write up some words that John said or some psychobabble that, that you get here. But what I want to do today is I really want to take this principle and show you from God's word where he teaches. And this is where we drew it out of to say God is really teaching us I am responsible to others, not for them. And if we will grasp this principle, if we will put this principle to play in our lives, we might just be able to move to a stress-free living. For the first time, people might not be able to stress us out. Anybody need some of that? <laughs> All right, turn with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at God's word on this. The, the Galatians chapter 6 is an amazing passage of the Bible. Um, this is in your outlines as well. And we're going to take a look at the first part of this principle in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. We're not going to cover everything from Galatians chapter 6, so my recommendation would be go back and read it, and you'll find some incredible principles here. But here's what it says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. It says, carry each other's burdens. If you could circle something for me today, circle that word, burdens. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So I think we have to explain what this word burdens means. Okay? So in the Greek, which I oftentimes don't do, but I think it's very important in this case to understand what this term means. He's saying, hey, you need to help people with burdens that they can't lift. It means excess burdens. It means overload. It really, it really has a connotation of the word boulder. Kind of like if you're walking down a road and there's a boulder in the road, you can't move that by yourself. Some of us think we can, but, but a lot of times, we, have you ever had a boulder in your life where you go, I can't, I can't lift that? Or, or maybe debt is the thing, right? Finances, you ever had that? A boulder in your finances where you go, I can't lift that off of me. And, and you need help. Um, and, and that's kind of the idea is that these catastrophes that hit us, these things that, that are difficult, how do we move these big boulders out of the way. And, and God is saying we need each other to do that. we got to care for each other. You can't do this by yourself. 
I thought this was going to be a message on setting boundaries and, and saying no to things. And the first thing I want you to see is this today, is that the first part of this equation we can very easily miss, and the truth is, is the freedom to do what we're going to talk about here is found at the end, okay? But, but what we've got to understand is this, I am responsible to other people, okay? I am responsible to others, that God made it that way. God wants us to help people. And the reason I'm saying that is I've preached messages on boundaries before, and I had people take it all wrong, so it must have been them. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> but I had people that came to me, and they said, do you, you think God doesn't want us to help people? Nothing could be further from the truth. God is teaching us. We are responsible to other people. In fact, he's saying, hey, when we see these boulders in people's lives, he's showing us that. He's opening the eyes of our hearts to be able to help other people. That's what Christianity is truly all about. And that's, that's a very important thing, that God wants us to help people. Can you look at somebody say that? God wants us to help people. Maybe not you, but we want, he wants us to help somebody. Okay, so you get the idea. He said, I'm responsible to help people, and God wants us to help people, but God wants us to help people in the right way. When you don't help them in the right way, you could probably do more harm than good, and that's what the truth is here. And if you're stressed out today, you're probably going to want to pay attention to this next part because this may be where you're struggling. You're going, hey, man, I got that. I, I am helping people. In fact, I'm going way beyond what I should be helping people. You get it? And today we're going to talk about how do, we, how do we make sure we're helping them in the correct way. So Galatians goes on to say this. You can go back and read the rest, but we're going to skip down to verse 5. It says this, For each one should carry their own load. Okay, now I'm kind of confused, right? I want you to circle that word load. We're going to explain what that means too. In the first part he said each one, we should help carry each other's burdens. And now he comes back almost contradictory to say each person should carry their own load. Hey, you, ever, you ever struggle with this one? When do I help people? When do I don't? You, you get there's a little bit of tension here. That when, when is it appropriate for me to help? And, and when do I just say, no, this is on you? And the pendulum kind of swings back and forth. We got those people that say, we're the tough love people that say, hey, you need to learn how to fish yourself. And if you won't do it, then I guess you're going to starve a little bit. You know? Doesn't the Bible say if you don't work, you don't eat? And that's really what this has to do with, right? There's consequences. You carry your own load. I am responsible to others, but not for them. Now, I want to be clear. God wants us to help people, but he wants us to help them in the right way. And when we help them with this part, that's a sin for them and for us. Now, that's hard, right? I mean, because it was like, well, I thought God wants us to help people. He does. But if you help them in the wrong way, you're not helping them. You're enabling them. You're actually hurting people, not helping them. This is a very, very difficult principle, and it's one we have to wrestle with because it would be very easy if the message were, you know what we need to do? Just say no to everything. If you say no to everything, that's real easy boundaries. Have you ever done that? But then we're not actually fulfilling the law of Christ that says we have to help people carry their burdens. On the other hand, what does this mean not to carry their what? And this load word here means this. It means their daily burden. It means their daily toil. It has the same connotations of if you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> you get the idea? Now, we all know that there's people that can't work, right? And we would help them. But the people that can, it's, on, it's, not, it's not healthy to feed people that can feed themselves. That's what it means. And this is so important to the equation because i got a feeling if you're stressed, this is probably the part that is stressing you out. So I'm not saying God doesn't want you to help people, but he wants you to help them in the right way. So, so let, me, let me explain a little bit about what this daily load means. I, I learned a little bit about that when I went hiking with um, Frenchie, for those of you guys that know Frenchie. He's hiking the Appalachian Trail, and I think he's already halfway past. He's already hiked over 1,000 miles on the Appalachian Trail, and um, he's got half more to go. And so I did a little bit of hiking with him. And I didn't know as much about hiking, so when you go out, you learn, hey, man, you've got to carry everything. You know, there's nothing out there. There's no facilities. There's no water. There's no nothing. You carry everything you need for water, for all this stuff. And so I had all this stuff and uh, pots and pans and stuff that I thought I would need, you know. And, uh, and so I'm carrying it, and I've got a World War II backpack. That's what I have. <laughs> and uh, he's got all this nice equipment. But anyway, that's a whole different issue. And so I'm out there, and he's looking at me, and he's like, what in the world? You know? And I tell you, you need to make sure you get your weight down. How much does that thing weigh? I go, I have no idea. And so halfway through, we, we stop, and he goes, man, you look really exhausted from, <laughs> from walking here. <laughs> and, and he's like, man, you got bruises on your shoulders from carrying all that stuff. What is going on? And so he looks in my pack, and he's like, man, what in the world do you got in here? You got metal stuff. You got all this stuff you don't need. You don't need this. You don't need that. Can I tell you what he didn't say to me? He never offered one time to carry my load. Okay? Not once. 
I was waiting for it. You know, like, maybe you could carry a little, no, no, none of that. Now, would he have helped me if I fell? Yeah. Would, would he have helped me if I really needed something? Or if, let's say, I broke my leg and I couldn't carry my pack, would he have helped me then? Absolutely. Would he help me carry stuff that I didn't need? Absolutely not. He's not going to help me carry my daily load. Can I tell you something? When you're carrying people's daily load, you're sinning. And not only are you sinning, that's the reason why you're stressed. You'll never be able to move from stress to rest as long as you're violating this principle. You are not responsible to other people. You're responsible to other people, not for them. Does that make sense? There's an equation issue here. Where you have authority, you have responsibility. Okay? When you see a burden, it gives you some responsibility. It gives you some authority into their life to go, I'm going to help you get this off. I can speak into your life. I can do this thing. When it comes to daily toil, what it means is, is they're making all the decisions and you're having all the responsibility. And now you've got an equation problem. Does that make sense? Where there's authority, there's responsibility. Let me tell you something. That's biblical. When you stand before God, guess how you stand? By yourself. Okay? You're not going to stand with them. Oh, but they can't do it without me. Yeah, no, and they won't because they're carrying burdens that they shouldn't be carrying. You know, you know when I stopped carrying that stuff? If he had said, hey, I'll carry that for you, I would have never learned, hey, you know what, I'm not carrying that stuff no more. Instead, it was advice going, hey, hey, pilgrim. <laughs> Don't ask me. I guess we're going back in 1800s or something. Anyway, hey, pilgrim, you, know, you got the wrong stuff in this pack. and Leave that stuff off. Just, back, just leave it on the trail. Give that to somebody else. You don't need all that stuff. You get it? And that's what's going to help people the most. And we're going to talk a little bit about how can we have freedom in this. Because the truth is, is some of us are stressed to the hilt. And the reason we are isn't because we're moving boulders in people's lives, but we're carrying their daily toil. And if you don't grasp this, you will be, you will be a slave. Okay? And today we're going to tell you how you can be free. It might not be easy, okay? Do you understand this journey might not be an easy one? <laughs> you can shake your head. Yep, it's, it's not going to be necessarily an easy journey. This is going to be a difficult journey. But when you get there, let me tell you what's on the other side of this. Freedom from the stress of other people in your life. You can be stress-free of other people if you practice this. Now, you can't have it today. It's going to take some time, okay? Get it? So, all right, so let's get into it. Jesus illustrates this very principle in Luke chapter 10. Uh, Jesus had, I just want to set the story up for you. Jesus had a, a lawyer who came to him and, and he was asking him questions. And, and he was basically telling Jesus, hey, I've done this and I've done that. And what do you think, Jesus? And Jesus told him, he said, you can go back and read this for yourself. Jesus told the lawyer, he said, hey, if you want to know what the greatest commandment is, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind. And then he said, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, this guy was a lawyer. So what does he say? Verse 29, he says, but he wanted to justify himself. <laughs> Imagine that, a lawyer. Um, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, technicality, Jesus, I need you to define who my neighbor is, not realizing that that's exactly what Jesus wanted him to say. And Jesus said, yeah, I, I don't want to just say it out loud. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story that has some principles in it, and that's going to be a lot easier. And, and always do that, because here's the thing. It's always easier if you're going to tell somebody something that's hard for them to hear, talk about somebody else. <laughs> and then kind of turn the tables around and say, hey, and he's talking about you. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's always easier to talk about somebody else. So he says, all right, let me tell you what, who your neighbor is. You, you think you're supposed to do it, so here it is. Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Okay. Um, let me pause there. So, so let me make sure you guys understand. So, so basically, this guy was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he had to kind of go through a, a bad part of town where there was people that robbed people. That, they were kind of known for that. It's kind of like here. When you, if you went from Windsor to Virginia Beach, some of us are doing that right now, and you had to go through Portsmouth. Okay. <laughs> I think my mom's here today. Isn't she? I'm sorry. My mom is from Portsmouth. I'm from Portsmouth, so it's okay. Relax. Some people are, like, really offended. It's, yeah, I'm offending all the Portsmouth people. Don't want to do that. Y'all might beat me up or carjack me or something. Okay, <laughs> they teach you back there. Okay, <laughs> And they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. They, they carjacked him. No, they, they camel jacked him. <laughs> you get the idea? They camel jacked this guy. This guy now is beat up. He's on the side of the road. He don't have nowhere to go. And, and if you've ever been there, that's a tough place to be, isn't it? And, and, and what is he, what's happening? He has a boulder in his life. Do you, you recognize that's what this is? This is a burden. This is one of those things. He can't help himself now. He actually needs help. Somebody, if somebody don't come help him, he can't help himself. That's the picture. Verse 31. 
a priest happened to be coming down the same road. Priest means some, a religious person. You get the idea? A, a, a leader in religion. And when he saw the man, I want you to circle that word. When he saw the man, okay, when he saw, can you, can you circle that? Because Jesus points this out quite a bit. He sees him, and what does he do? He passes by on the other side. I mean, this is the religious guy. Shouldn't he get involved? You ever met religious people that are way up there and they don't want to get their hands dirty? Now, some people think that about me. I don't have a lot of technical skills, so I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty, but there's some jobs you don't want me doing. <laughs> like all the contracting people in church say, Pastor, you go do that. Don't come over here and help us. But, but some people are scared to get their hands dirty, right? I mean, that's kind of the connotation. It's like he saw him, and it was like one of those where you go, like, oh, I don't want to see that, right? Or I don't want to get involved in that. Or maybe, maybe, as, as we think about the story today, because there's all kinds of applications to the Good Samaritan story. But, but what we want to talk about today is just as it relates to I am responsible to others, not for them. H- have, you ever been, have you ever taken on too much responsibility for somebody, and then when you see another need, you're like, I don't want to get involved again? Anybody ever done that? Like, I've been involved in that before, and it's going to be a big mess. And if I, get, if I start this, it's going to be bad for me. So let's just not even start getting involved with that. So I'm going to go, don't want to see that. See? He understands I'm responsible to people, but I just don't want to get involved. Okay, you get the idea. Verse 32, so too a Levite, this is kind of a, a, another religious person, and, and when, he, when he came to the place and he saw, can you want to circle that word saw again? He passed by on the other side. God is showing them this is a need, this is a boulder, and let me tell you again, I am responsible to other people. And Jesus is given a connotation, this is not a good thing. You, are, you see a need that God is showing, and you're not getting involved because it's messy and it will inconvenience your life, and it's so true. And I have a feeling for some of them, it's because they didn't have proper boundaries, and they're going, I don't think I want to get involved, because if I do, there's legal issues here. This person could sue me. This person could do something to me. I need to think about all the trajectories, and so it's just easier to say, maybe somebody else will deal with that. Or maybe it's his fault. You ever done that? It's his fault. And so, therefore, I'm not going to do that. He drove down the wrong road. He didn't know where he was at. He, he, he was going, he was in Portsmouth, man. What was, was he thinking? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll let that go, sorry. Verse, 30, verse 33. I've lost all my Portsmouth audience. I love you guys, okay? Verse 33. But a Samaritan, now Jesus is provocative, and we'll get into that another time. Jesus basically uses the guy that's born on the wrong side of the tracks. And, and so he's going, hey, he's talking to a religious leader, and, and the guy's going, these are supposed to be the heroines of the story, and he picks the guy that's the least likely heroine. And we'll get into that at some other time. As he traveled, he came where the man was, and what did he do? And when he saw, you circle that? When he saw him, something happened inside of him. He saw him, and he took pity on him. That, that's the way it should be. What, what happened here was he saw the man, and he took pity on him. On him, he, he saw him. He saw him for the first time. Can I tell you, that's where vision, vision is birthed out of that kind of stuff. That's where vision is birthed. When God shows you a need, tangible, where you are, and you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden it's like, boom. And it's like, because he was a godly man, he saw it, and he went, I've got to do something. Because why? Because I am responsible to others. Get it? So big. Okay. Verse 34. So he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man in his own donkey, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. I'll tell you something, this cost this man. This guy got very involved. He was willing to be inconvenienced. Whatever he had planned for the day, he put on hold to remove the boulder that was in this guy's life. Maybe he had been there. Maybe he had seen that happen in his family. Maybe because he's from the wrong side of tracks, he understood, man, I know what that's like. I've had that happen to me. And so for some reason, God allowed him to see that man in a different light, not like the guy that goes, I don't want to get involved. Oh, I don't think he's good enough. Oh, he's messy. He goes, I'm willing to get into the mess because God has called me to that. I am responsible to other people. Please don't hear that I'm saying God isn't calling you to help people. Okay. Now, this is a story. I want to make sure before you get too attached to these characters, these aren't real people. Did you know that? Jesus is illustrating a story, so he could have chosen any words that he wanted, and he picked the next ones. And I want you to pay attention to it, because I think the next part of this story is where we are struggling. Okay, Verse 35. The next day, he took out two denarii. Now, he, he actually waited an entire day, which means he actually inconvenienced himself. He took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, and he said, Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. We're going to camp out there for just a minute because you might not realize there's a big point here. 
but there is. Um, and, and Jesus then finishes up the story, and he says, hey, let me ask you a question then, lawyer. Who is the neighbor in the story? You know, when God says, love your neighbor as yourself, who is the actual neighbor here? <laughs> and the guy has to say, the Samaritan. <laughs> you know what I mean? That guy. Uh, and that ends the story, okay? But, but I want you to see on the note that he ended on, because he didn't have to share this, but he did. And here's the part that I want you to underline. When I return. Now, Jesus didn't have to say that. Why, why wasn't this story? This guy stayed with this guy until he was all better, but he didn't. You know what this means that this guy did? This means this guy stopped and helped him. He got him bandaged up, and then he went on about his business, and he came back to help the guy. This, is a, this, and this, might, this seems like the small point. This is the point. And this is where a lot of us are struggling today. You might not see it. See, this guy had freedom. He had freedom to help. He had freedom to leave. And he had freedom to come back. And a person without boundaries cannot do that. This Samaritan guy, the reason the other two guys didn't get involved, I can almost guarantee you, they didn't have boundaries. So they were scared to get involved. You see, boundaries doesn't make us so we can't help people. It frees us to help people in the correct way. That's so clear. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I'm responsible to others and not for them. Let me tell you how this story could have went. I read this in the book Boundaries by Henry Cloud. Um, I highly recommend that book. It's awesome. But here's how the story could have went. He said this, the injured man could have said when the guy said, hey, I've got to leave and then I'll come back to you. He could have said, what, you're leaving? <laughs> you ever heard that? You're leaving me now? And the Samaritan says, yes, I have some business to attain to in Jericho. And the injured man says, don't you think you're being selfish? You ever had that happen? You said, no, this is what I'm going to do. And then they come back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I hear what you're saying, but don't you think that's selfish? Right? I'm, I'm, in, I'm in pretty bad shape here. I'm going to need someone to talk to, don't you think? How is Jesus going to use you as an example? <laughs> right? You ever had anybody say that? You're not even acting like a Christian, abandoning me in my time of need. Right? I mean, he's already moved the boulder out of the way, but now the guy's asking for a little bit more. And isn't that true? We should stay with people. And it starts to work him over in his mind. And the guilt message starts to work him over where he goes, oh, well, maybe, maybe I should. Whatever happened to denying yourself, right? I mean, you're only thinking about you. You need to go do that work. But I'm here by myself, and I'm still hurting. And I literally, literally am hurting. Something bad happened to me, and you're going to leave me in my time of need. And some of us, that's right where we've been. The Samaritan says, well, I guess, right? I mean, some of us have done that, right? It's like, well, now I can't leave because if I do, I'm going to feel like the bad guy, right? Anybody ever had that feeling? And that would be uncaring of me to leave, so I should, I should do more. I will postpone my trip for a few days. And, and here's how the story could have ended. So, so three days later, he's been s staying with this guy, and he's feeling pretty good because he's actually helping him, and this guy's going, I couldn't have done this without you, and, and if you hadn't stayed with me, I, I don't know where I would be without you. I couldn't do this without you. Thank God that God brought you into my life. In fact, I don't even need God because you're here, right? <laughs> but then in three days, he gets the message back, and it says, it says this. The messenger comes to him, and he, and he says, uh, waited as long as I could, have decided to sell my camels to another party, and our next herd is in six months. The money that he was using to pay for this stuff, the money he was using to pay to help this guy, the money he's using to pay for his family is there. And now the Samaritan is ticked, right? Because he's going, after everything I've done for this guy, I wasn't going to stay. And then he pushed me. And now I'm mad at him because I stayed, right? And it's his fault because he did this to me, right? How could you do this to me? Look what you've done now, <laughs> You've caused me to lose my camels and, and my business, and how is my family going to take care of themselves? And now I can't even deliver my goods. This will put me out of business. How am I going to pay for your bill? I've done racked up a bill helping you. How could you do this to me? Let me ask you a question today. Anybody have that going on in your life right now? Today we're going to talk about how do you have freedom from that? How, how do you set limits without, without guilt? And I think today we want to talk a little bit about how do we overcome that because for some of us we're going, I want to get involved in people's lives, and some of us are, and we're going, but that works me over because, yeah, but if I leave them and then they say that, then I go back to work and I feel guilty and I don't feel like I can do that, right? And some of us are stuck thinking we're doing the godly thing when we're actually we're not. We're actually enabling them, and it's stressing us out, and we don't know how to break free from that, and God wants you to be free today. God wants you to understand the principle, I am responsible to other people 
but not for them. And, and we want to unpack this just a little bit further today. So, so let me share with you a couple of guilt messages that work. Let me tell you how the guilt messages come, though. What happens is, is for some of us, we listen to a message like we did two weeks ago, and we go, that's great. That's where I want to live. I'm not really there yet. I have stress in my life, and I have stressful people in my life. But then you start to try to make strides to go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start setting some healthy boundaries. I'm going to start setting some limits on myself. That's what we really mean. I'm going to start saying, hey, you know what, I can only work so long, I can only do this much, and I need this amount of time with my family, and I need these kinds of things, and, and the church is asking me to do this, and I'll, do, I'll serve a certain amount, but, but that's, as much, that's as far as I can go. And then somebody comes and says, hey, can you do this thing? And you say, you're smart enough. See, you've already started practicing the principle, so now you know how you're supposed to live. You've got your schedule out, and you're going, yeah, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden, you say, no, I can't do it today, Right? I'm setting healthy boundaries in my life. I'm getting a new thing. It's not that your thing is bad. I want to do that. And then they come back with a guilt message, right? Hey, let me see if, if I can understand. You ask me to do this, and you say, you, but you know, you know if I had it, I'd do it for you, all right? Or, or, they, or, they, or they set up and say, after all I've done for you, and you can't do this one thing for me. Now, 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 let me be clear. I'm not saying we're not responsible to other people. Some of us are feeling guilty because somebody confronted us about something we're supposed to be doing. We're not helping anybody, and we're living our lives for materialism and all that. But some of us are actually trying to practice godly principles, and we go, no, no, it's not that. It's not that I don't recognize that I need to help people. I am helping people, but that's as far as I can go. And then when, my, when I've reached my limit, somebody says, um, maybe after I'm dead and gone, you'll be sorry. Huh? Anybody had that one? That's a direct quote from some people in my family, but anyway, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> and then we go, man, I can't wait. When is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you were the son, you should be, right? If you were the daughter, you should be. If you were the mom, you should be. If you were the father, you should be, right? I mean, after they say that, they just kind of tack that on, right, to, to, to provide that, that, you know, you can go and do that if you want to, but you're going to pay a price for that. And some of us are going, we're just throwing up our hands and going, well, you know what, I might as well just do it because I don't want to go there and feel like a bad person. Or some of us, we actually think we are, right? We, some of us actually think we are a bad person if, well, they're upset, so it must mean Right? Or, or they even say, they'll, they'll give you permission, but it's not what they say, it's how they say it. Okay, but we really needed you. Right? Why did you have to say that? Right? But, but think about it. I'm only pointing it out because maybe you don't realize people are doing it, but when you think about it, when you've actually come to a determination, I'm not talking about somebody's confronting you because you're doing something wrong. I'm talking about where you have actually thought about it and you say, hey, look, not every need is a calling. God's not calling me to that. And somebody goes, okay, but we really needed you. Or after the fact, when you come back and you're rested and all that and you have joy back in your life, and then all of a sudden somebody sees you and says, man, I really wish you could have been there. Right? Really wish you could have been there. Isn't that true? You feel it, right? I mean, it happens, doesn't it? <laughs> Amen to that. Would have been nice to be able to do whatever it is you're doing, right? They want you to feel guilty. Well, I guess it's nice for you. I guess it's nice for you to be able to do that. Wish I could do stuff like that. I can't take off work like that. I can't spend time with my family like that. I don't like my family, <laughs> yeah, so whatever. Really wish you could have been there. Hope, hope you had fun. You get it? You get those pictures? And it works people over. And it's a spoiler at the end of it. And what I want you to be able to do today is this, is recognize it for what it is. It is not from God. I am responsible to others, not for them. And you recognize that guilt messages are not from God. They're actually from Satan himself. And what Satan is doing, he's using a kernel of truth, and he's saying, I want to work you over so you will never be stress-free. You keep doing all the good stuff, and you got stress way up here because you're never going to be free. You get the picture? Sometimes they come disguised in God talk. <laughs> is that true? Churches are the worst. I know, I'm part of one. Okay. <laughs> How can you call yourself a Christian, right? How can you call yourself a Christian and not help out with this? Christians would definitely do it. They're declaration statements, right? Doesn't the Bible say to honor your parents? It does. In fact, the Bible goes on to say, if you don't take care of your family, you have denied the faith and you are worse than an unbeliever. They like to use that verse too. But what they really mean is this, is that not just removing the boulder, but I need you to do everything for me. I have a gaping hole, and now even though you have a need, now they all of a sudden become the center of the universe. Anybody have that happen with your parents? Your elderly parents, 
your, your godly parents that you want to take care of, but yet they're in a stage in their life where that's everything. And now they're throwing guilt messages and they're working you over. And so I could take a break and no one else, here's where we know, nobody else can help them but me. If you're saying that, you got a problem. Get it? No, you're not. Who are you? You're God? What happens when you go? <laughs> right? Think about that for a minute. We got to come to the place where we go, there is a God and we're not him. And some of us are letting people worship at our feet, not God's feet. So we're meeting all their needs. We're thinking we're God. That's why it's working us over because we're actually thinking, if I don't do it, then ne- no one will ever be able to do it. And I'm not talking about not moving boulders. I'm not, t- not talking about not helping people. Let me explain again. I am responsible to others, but not for them. Get it? Okay. I thought Christians were supposed to help other people. There's a guilt message. So how do we overcome these guilt messages How do we overcome them? The first thing I see is this, is you need to recognize that that's what they are. Recognize them for what they are. When somebody does that, when you go, I have made a decision, and I have received counsel, and I know I'm in the right here. I know that I'm I'm structuring my life in the correct way, and somebody tacks that on, then start to recognize them. You're, and let me tell you something. After today, you're, as you walk around, you're going to start to see that. You're going to start to remember that. And when somebody says, you know, I can't do that, you're going to see little sarcastic tones. You're going to see little passive-aggressive ways that people go, here's how I get my way. I manipulate you. And they know exactly what they're working you over. Now, they might not even mean to do it. By the way, you're going to see yourself using this. The hard part is you're going to go, I do that. <laughs> That's how I get my kids to do stuff, right? That's a hard one, right? So stop doing that <laughs> if, if it's you. You know who you are. I wanted to say your name, but I won't. Okay. All right, you get the idea. (laughs) But here's what I want you to recognize about the guilt message that will help you move it away from anger. It It is hiding the real message for that person. That if you recognize that guilt messages aren't about you, it's about the other person's feelings. Okay? Sometimes it's anger that's in disguise. Sometimes it's other things behind the the little little things they're digging out. And as soon as you start to recognize that, you'll realize, hey, man, they're hiding sadness. What is that about? Why are you feeling that way? When you recognize it's a feeling, you'll realize the Christian world needs to get okay with it isn't a sin just because somebody's upset. Now, we think it is. (gasps) They're upset. That means I have to fix it. I have to fix them. I have to be responsible for them. I'm responsible for their feelings. (laughs) Can I laugh about that? Think about that for a minute. My job is to make sure they always feel happy. Well, there's a loser, right? How many people always feel happy? You never always feel happy. Can I tell you, Jesus faced the exact same thing, and he recognized it for what it was. Think about it. When you go back through the stories of Jesus, you will find times where Jesus was there, and he set boundaries, and he said, I can't be there today. The message came, your friend Lazarus is sick you need to come. He's to the point of death. And Jesus said, no, I can't make it right now. And when he got there, you know what he got met with? It's your fault that Lazarus is dead. And you know what Jesus did? He is the great example for us of how to overcome guilt messages. He didn't yell at them. He didn't say, how could you treat me this way? He didn't go and start crying to himself and go, I should have been here. Wait a minute. If he said that and he's God. He, he made a mistake. God didn't make a mistake. Jesus set a boundary. That's not a mistake. People are upset. Jesus didn't make a mistake. What Jesus did was he cared for them. You see what he did? He recognized that their guilt message was attached to emotion. You should have been here. And he said, I know what you're pro- I know you, Mary, and I know what you need to know that Lazarus, Lazarus will re- be raised in the resurrection. And Martha, he just cried with her. They blamed him, and he cried with them. He recognized the emotion. It's okay. If people are upset, he recognized it's okay. And here's what I want you to know about guilt messages. That's going to free you up in a way that you can't believe. And that's this. If guilt messages are working on you, this is going to be the hardest part of this whole thing, but the most free. I want to make sure I say that because it's going to be just like I punched you in the gut. Okay. If guilt messages are working you over, it isn't their fault. Let me, let me, let me preface this. If you're using guilt messages, you're wrong. Okay. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. All right. If you're, if you're using guilt messages today, you're absolutely wrong. But if guilt messages are working you over, it is your fault, not theirs. Can I say it different? If you're stressed out today by people, it is your fault, not theirs. <laughs> you have the problem. 
Whenever I'm disturbed, the problem is me. Ooh. Did it feel like I hit you in the gut yet? Anybody raise your hand and say, people stress me out. If I could only get those people out of my life. And now you just said it's my fault. (laughs) it's, It's dawning on you right now what I actually just said, isn't it? But the reason why I said it wasn't to be offensive. The reason why I said, by the way, I was offended by that. Somebody said that to me. I was offended by it for years, and and he didn't care. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Because it helped me. It helped me understand something. When I let people do that to me, it's my fault, not theirs. So i got to explain some stuff about setting boundaries. Understand this. It is about their emotions. It is about their feelings. And it's okay for them to feel that way. In fact, that's a great place for you to start. When, When they say, really wish you could have been there, you go, You could say, I need to understand, why did you say that? I need to understand, are are you trying to make me feel guilty for spending time with my family? Is that kind of turn the tables around a little bit? I need to understand where that's coming from. Oh, I didn't mean anything about it. Well, no, I think you did, because you've said this many times. So what's going on? Let's have a real conversation. By the way, they'll kind of run away. And when when you no longer enable them, they'll find somebody else that will. You can't stop that, by the way. But they'll stop doing it to you after a while. Now, it's going to get harder before it gets easier. Hey, let me say something. Everybody loves boundaries until you actually practice them. <laughs> when you set a boundary, everybody's going to go, you need to have boundaries in your life. And then you say no to them, and you're going to see a whole different side. See, You need to recognize that these messages are not coming from God. They're coming from Satan. And here's the other thing is, don't argue with the devil. When they're trying to make you feel guilty, and that you know it's emotional, and you know they're going apoplectic, it's, the answer is no. I don't have to explain it, and I don't have to justify it. Some of us think we do. Some of us think we have to... It's funny that Christians do this, but it's true. Some of us think we have to make up stuff. So they ask us to do something, but instead of being honest and saying the answer is no, what we say is, well, I got something else I got to do. No, you don't. I didn't. You just made up stuff, and then you got to go home to your spouse, right? And you got to say, mm, yeah, I told them, make right? sure you tell them that we did have to do blah, 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 right? And we think it's better. You know why it's better? Because we didn't upset them. You're not helping them, by the way. You're enabling them. You're letting them work you over. And then you start to avoid those other people. And let me tell you what it's doing to you. It's robbing you of the freedom to help people because here's what you're doing. Every time somebody comes around, you're doing one of these. You see the need, but you're not empowered to get involved because now you're responsible for other people. You're responsible for other people's feelings. Let me tell you something. That is the biggest loser that there is. And what you need to do is the same thing I need to do, and it's very difficult to do, and that is to change our focus from pleasing people to Jesus himself. What is it God is calling you to do? Can I tell you something today? Every need is not a calling. But it's a legitimate need. Yeah, no, but he's not calling you to do it. And the problem, let me tell you something, whenever I'm disturbed, the problem is me. That's hard. All right? It's them. They're doing this to me. They, after everything, I've, if you're saying that, after all I've done, and they, I just give and give and give and give. Why are you giving? Why are you giving more than you should? Because they've guilt tripped and that's not only wrong, it's a sin to do so. You are carrying their daily load, and you are enabling them, and when you're gone, they can't carry this thing anyway. It'll collapse them. Get it? Some people are carrying them out of debt that they can't carry. They're carrying them out of load that they can't have. And I wish I had more, but they can't get rid of their stuff. You know what I mean? They can't live the life that God has given them. And they want to rob your freedom. That's not going to work. doesn't mean we don't care. It doesn't mean we don't move some boulders out of people's ways. I'm responsible to them, not for them. You see, but some of us, the problem for us is, is that we actually think, we actually enjoy this because here's the people-pleasing part. We like the accolades for it, right? When you say no, they don't like you. (laughs) When you say yes, they like you. Not only do they like you, but they say things like this. We couldn't have done it without you. If you hadn't been there, if you weren't everything to us, and what we're really doing is, this is really hard. We actually think we're God. They can't do it without you. Not only can't they do it without you, they won't do it without you. And you have them dependent upon you and not God. Sometimes we need to change the focus and say, you need to focus on God. Sometimes there's a need, a legitimate need, that you go, but I can't meet that. So what do we have to do? Well, I'm going to throw my credit card at it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to violate biblical principles, and I'm going to lend you money. 
I'm only saying this because this is something that comes up over and over and over again to me where people are resentful because they've lent somebody money and now the person's not paying them back or the person's not living by godly principles that they gave, gave them more than what they could do. And what are you going to do about it, Pastor? I'm going to help you by not getting involved. <laughs> you get the picture? So, so here's my point. Understand this. I am responsible to others and not for them. And if we started practicing that, we would be free to help people. We would be free, like the Good Samaritan, to do what? To come into their lives and help them. We would also be free to leave and say, I've done what I can, and now I'm going to leave. What, you're going to leave me? Yep. That feeling of insecurity, you know what? God's going to take care of you. I'm not God. I'm pointing you to God, not me. And the more you do that, the better off you're going to be. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't help people. Everybody clear on that? This is going to free you to help people in a responsible way. And when you do, the stress will come off of you. So let me ask you a question. Imagine this morning. Imagine freedom from stress from people. Now, I hope nobody has the delusion that we're just going to give you that today. You're going to walk out these doors and you're stress-free. What I really want you to do is this. We want to give you the keys to make this happen. What I really want to do is I want to give you, I want to map out a course that will help you get there, okay? Understanding that this is not a a one-day journey. This is not, hey, oh, I got this. Now I got it under my belt. This is a start walking in the right direction, and God's going to free you. And this is going to start coming off of you. And one day you're just going to walk right on out of your mess. Get it? One day you're just going to walk right on out of your stress. One day you're going to walk and you're going to go, you know what? I'm walking in joy. I'm walking in freedom. I don't have all those burdens anymore. I love people again. (laughs) I'm not just stressed out by people. I actually love people again. And we want that, right? So let me give you the steps to get there. Let me give you the keys to get there. How, How can I set limits without guilt? Five things, and I want you to take them with you. Because we don't want to just tell you what to do. It's very easy to do that, isn't it? Very easy to say, I don't, you shouldn't be doing that, and just hammer that point home. It's your fault. And then you leave just feeling guilty and don't know what to do. Today, we don't want you feeling guilty. You know what we want you? We want you to walk out of the door with a plan. And if you'll write this down, and you'll take it home, and you'll look at it, and you'll pray over it, I'll bet you anything, as you start walking this, you're going to walk right out of your stress and right into the rest that God wants to give you. You're going to walk right into the freedom that God wants to give you. Okay, here's what you got to do. Number one, you got to admit you have a problem. For some of us, this is almost impossible to admit. We say, you're doing too much. Oh, no, 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 not me. Oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I know I'm doing that this one time. This is just for a season kind of thing. <laughs> admit you got a problem with boundaries. Admit this is a big problem in your life. Admit these guilt messages are working you over. A lot of people say, no, they're not working me over. Yet you're sitting there and you're stressed out and it's boiling up in you and you don't know how to deal with it. The first thing you got to do is not solve the problem. The first thing you got to do is admit there is a problem. Can you do that? Number one. Number two. This is huge, especially for those of us that have been Christians longer. Realize there will be resistance. (laughs) You see, when you admit there's a problem, all of a sudden, for the first time, hope comes back into your life. And you start thinking, the problem's gone, because now I realize what it is. And if I understand it, then it's fixed. And no, it isn't. (laughs) That's just the first step. And the second step is this. Can I tell you something? Satan is a great enemy. And I have a lot, of, a lot of admiration for his tactics because here's what I know. He was not going to give up easily. Is that true? And when you try to take this territory, let me tell you something. You better get ready because he's going to come at you. This is not going to get easier, faster. What it's going to happen is it's going to get harder before it gets easier. And this is where people lose it oftentimes. They go, I just don't want to deal with that. So everybody loves for you to talk about boundaries until you set them with them. Now, you can talk about it all day long. Okay. But when you actually do it and you say, no, get ready, because they're going to go, what? How could you do that? The kids really need you. right? God really wanted you to do that. This is, what are you doing? You can't say no to me, right? <laughs> you get the picture? Get ready, because you're going to get hit with resistance. You're going to get the guilt messages you can't believe. It's as though Satan, and if you recognize it for what it is, what you're going to do is for the first time you're going to go, that isn't from God. Those messages aren't from God. You, you've now determined, here's what I'm supposed to do. Next week, we're going to talk about a plan to plan your life out. But, but here's the thing I know. Be ready because the resistance is coming. Okay, number three. Because resistance is coming, you're going to need some support. So seek some support. Too many people think, this. here's what you've done. You've admitted you had a problem. You, maybe you've done this before. And you realize resistance would come. 
And that's where you stop, and it hasn't worked for you, and you go, I'm stressed out because you're trying to do this by yourself. Can I tell you again? This is a process, man. This is a journey to walk in. If God had said, just say no to everything, it would be a very easy message today. Just say no, and that's easy. But what God said is, I want you to get involved, but I also want you to set boundaries. Well, I'm sorry, you made that very mystical, God. That's very hard to do because now I've got to be able to know, when am I being unloving? When, when should I? When shouldn't I? And, and the pendulum's going to swing back and forth. I'm not helping at all. Well, now you're not helping anybody. Now you're just a mean, awful person. You're not even a Christian, right? Or, or I'm on the other end, and I'm just enabling, 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 and I'm spent, and I'm burned out, and I'm stressed out to the hilt, and I have no freedom in Christ, and I'm burning out for Jesus. Well, I need help with that, right? You're going to need God to help you. You're going to need people to help you. And it's one of the reasons why we recommend you need a small group around you, whether, whether it's a formalized small group or a group of people that you're meeting with regularly. But if you're not, you are doomed. Can I say that? If you're not doing this, there's a reason why God instituted the church, and it's not an institution, it is not an org chart. It is the people that have Jesus giftings. And if you think that I can take these principles and apply them myself, I love when people say, this, can you be a Christian without going to church? <laughs> How? Because if you are and you think you can do this by yourself, you actually probably think you are God. Because Jesus is the only one that had all the gifts. And when he left, he dispersed them amongst us. And now you're saying, I can do it by myself and I don't need people. <laughs> no wonder you're failing. You can't do this by yourself. Seek some support. Maybe for some of you, you're new to the church and you're going, you know what, I've never plugged in. Maybe you've been here a long time and you still have never really plugged in. You come on Sundays, but you never really plugged in. I'd recommend before you leave today, sign up for the pastor's breakfast. We're going to do it in uh, a couple weeks, uh, August the 7th on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We're going to do it at least restaurant. Just to be clear, we're paying for breakfast, so don't think we're charging you for that. Somebody asked me that recently. And um, we want you to get involved, Okay. I don't care how long you've been here. If you haven't plugged in, please sign up. We want to get you plugged in. We want to get you knowing some people. This is not explaining the org chart of our church. It's going, hey, you need people in your life, and then we'll help you with the rest, okay? So number three, seek some support. Number four, let go and let God. This is huge. Realize there is a God, and you are not him. And it's going to free you in ways you can't believe when you go, you know what, we're going to have to trust God for this. It's going to bring God into the equation when you go, I don't have the means to do this. And you've got a broken heart for people and you're going, I can't do it because I don't have the means to do this. But now all of a sudden you're going, well, God, why did you show me this? And he's going, hello, do you realize that I'm God? I can do miracles? <laughs> no crisis, no miracle. Get out of the way. The problem is, is you're in the way of God's miracle sometimes when you're meeting needs that you have no business meeting. And the reason you're meeting them is you don't trust God that he will. You know what that is? That's a God complex. Get over yourself and get the freedom that God wants you to have. Let go and trust God. Let go and let God do this thing. And number five, enjoy the new freedom in Jesus Christ. And when you get it, don't you let anybody take it away from you. See, when you start measuring yourself not by the public opinion, when you start measuring yourself not by the people-pleasing mode that goes, everybody's pleased and no one's upset, if that's what you're waiting on, you're never going to be free. You're never going to have joy. But the day you go, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying the best I can to align myself to what Jesus wants. When he shows me a need that I'm supposed to meet, I'm going to do it. When he shows me a need I'm not supposed to meet, I'm not going to feel guilty for it. All of a sudden, you will have freedom in your life. You realize this is a journey, right? Anybody want freedom today? Let's stand for prayer.